it's my great pleasure to have uh, Professor Minxuan Yang here. Uh, he is currently uh, with uh, UC Merced and uh, also visiting uh, in NVIDIA research, right? So uh, I have a long history with Minxuan. Uh, he, uh, after he graduated uh, with his PhD in UIUC, he joined Honda Research and worked there for eight years and uh, mainly worked around the robots a fancy robots called Asimo, right? So uh, then, then he moved to UC Merced and uh, has been very uh, productive and uh, built a very strong group there, working on almost all fronts of computer vision, right? Tracking detection and uh, some low-level vision stuff. Today he's going to basically uh, share his latest results on some of the most uh, low-level vision stuff, right? Yeah. So, okay. Okay, Mishan, welcome, and the Thank floor you. is yours. Thank you. Yeah, so it's a pleasure to come here. So, yeah, so today I'll just give you an overview of what we have been doing for the last 10 years or so. So, um, although the title is Learning Filter and Style Transfer, but I will touch on several topics, um, say on tracking and um, what else? Uh, Silence detection and also deburring and super resolution. So, yeah, so to start with, most of you are not familiar with this school, so I'll just um, tell you where it is. So it's, we are in Northern California, about two hour from two hour drive from Silicon Valley and two hour drive from San Francisco, and so there there are ten campuses in UC and then three um, three national labs. So the school in in the middle of nowhere. So because we need a lot of land, so yeah, it's nothing in surrounding. I mean, it's all green there. At one point, there were more horses and cows than people. <laughs> but I went there in 2008, and it started in 2005. But we are close to Yosemite National Park, still about one and a half hour drive to the gate, but it's relatively close. Um, and the school, the school opens in 2005, and it's the latest one in UC. And so right, it, it, grow, it has been growing um, rapidly. In terms of size, and recently, so we have about eight thousand students now. And recently, there is a one point three billion dollar um, project called Twenty Twenty. So we are going to grow to ten thousand students. So there are a lot of construction going on. And so this is originally this campus will be right next to lake, but there were some dangerous, uh, dangerous, in dangerous spaces. So we had to move by half a mile. Uh, but anyway, so this is what it looks like nowadays. And we have a typical schools, engineering, natural sciences, and uh, Shaw, uh, social sciences. The department I'm in is very small. We have about 14, well, I think 14, uh, if, if you do not count uh, lecturers. Then we have 14 faculty members. We have people in different areas, sensor network, image processing, graphics, robotics, vision, and high-performance computing. And so, um, yeah, so I went there in 2008, and I had a few students. Uh, the first one was Javin, and he was a visiting student. Now he's a faculty member at Virginia Tech. And I had three students in 2009, and then three students in 2012. And, and yeah, they, they graduated. I graduated five students, or oh, six, uh, one with master. And the rest, I, right now I have six students and a couple of visiting students. And we work on different areas. We work on low level, mid level, high level vision. I, I used to work more on high level vision, but now um, in recent years we work a bit more on low level vision. And so, oh yeah, so I'll skip this. So, okay, so I will just touch on, and I'll, I'll first describe uh, many what we have been working on. And if you are interested in some of the topics, then I'll just delve into that, okay? So we've been working on visual tracking since early days. John Wu was one of the early contributors. So we've been working on tracking for, I mean, since 2000, I don't know, 2000 or 2000 ish. And so we work on a few tracker, um, incremental visual tracker, uh, meal track, and uh, super pixel tracking, uh, computer tracking, and so on and so forth. So you, and we also deal with faces or generic objects. and. And back then, in 2002-ish, uh, in 2000, well, sorry, 2010-ish, then people asked me, okay, what were what is a state-of-the-art tracker? At that time, we I could not answer that because at that time, people used different methods, different performance evaluation criteria, and different data sets for that. So it, we were not clear, and I was not even clear which one was the, the best one. So uh, at that time, we collect uh, a data set called online tracking benchmark, and there, there's one version with 50 sequences, and the other one is one, 100 sequences. 
And then basically we, we did a large scale, at that time large scale experiments on that to evaluate all the trackers. And we make the code available. And so you will see nowadays there are uh, quite a few people use that. And the long-term goal we want to do is to track and rack. And also um, a more ambitious goal is to track, rack, and reconstruct. But we haven't got to the reconstruct yet. Uh, so yeah, so this is the thing. Okay, so uh, if these are our uh, these are uh, this is a list of my papers. So back then, you, <laughs> John was one of them. So when we published this paper in two thousand four, we had uh, IVT. We have three videos, one method. We don't. We did not even need to compare with any other method. Nothing. Just show the result. Okay, and then two thousand six, five video, one method. That's it. No comparison. And then uh, 2008, and then we, okay, we had to run more sequences eight, and then we had to compare with six methods. And back then, there were not a lot of source code available, so we could not even do that unless you spend time to re-implement all the algorithm. Okay, and then so starting then, then people uh, share more core code and data sets, so then it's easier to compare with. So in 2010, there were two ten videos and eight methods, and then 2012 ECCV we published. Okay, we used the 20 video, and there was a <laughs> kind of large scale at that time, and eight methods. And then, okay, as I mentioned, so in 2013, we published, uh, we published this paper with 50 videos and 30 methods, and we, with code library. And then we extended to a uh, journal paper with 100 videos. And nowadays, you, you'll see that, I mean, you cannot list the whole thing. I mean, you just list the top few. <laughs> so this is how it goes. <laughs> So now it, this field is getting more and more competitive. So I mean, back then we just need to run that. That's it. We did not even have quantitative result. We just have a qualitative result. That's it. Um, so yeah. So and then so back then we we uh, the problem was basically usually, usually people use very few sequences and they did not have a ground truth to compare with and you just show the result. And so and we did we collect data set and then we annotate all the attributes and. Um, put everything in one code library. Um, yeah. So, and we also come up with several ways to evaluate um, a methods. So, we we find that there are often times there are some tricks. <laughs> some people play some tricks in presenting a result. You do not necessarily uh, start from the first frame. You start from a certain frame, and then the the result will be quite different. Because back then uh, the because if you work on online tracking, one, all you have is one uh, bounding box in the first frame. And that matters because all you have is one frame. And you want to use that to build model and then track. So, uh, uh, and the bounding box size also matter. I mean, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of details. So we, we came up with several uh, criteria to evaluate methods. So nowadays, you will see these kind of figures pretty, pretty frequently. I, I think David Ross and Joe came up with this, this kind of figure. So uh, now you, for most tracking paper, you will see such figures, either using OTP50 or OTP100. And there, this, the, the most common one is one pass, you just run it once. But then there are also a special um, robustness evaluation and temporal robust. So basically, what we're saying is that you, you, the bounding box size matters, and also where you start matters. And if the tracker fails, how do you reinitialize that? Those things all matter. And that would show you different results. And yeah, so then there are special robustness, temporal. Basically, just, basically you can think that that's a sensitivity analysis in terms of spatial domain and temporal domain. Yeah, so, and then, um, so that was before uh, the boon of uh, deep learning. And after that, we also use some diff feature for that. Uh, we have different ways to use that. So one, one particular method we use is that if you look at, at um, we at that time we we look at the AlexNet and then you have different layers. You have features from different layers and how do you incorporate? Because features from different layers will give you different different kind of information. So how do you elaborate and then use that? In a way, it's like boosting, but you know it's online, so we use uh, one hash algorithm for that. It's similar to boosting, but not quite. And so then you can build simple trackers using features at different layers and put them together. And by the way, this is my hand. You, I, there are a lot of stuff that I don't see on my face, but there are a lot of stuff in the OTP fifty. We just you know I have to collect video on my own. Uh, on my own. I think and, you've done this with everybody. 
shows their face in the video. Right? <laughs> yeah, but I, uh, we, we, because of anonymity, so we did not want to do that. So <laughs> yeah, I asked him, so I asked my intern at that time, David, David Ross, there's one sequence called David sequence, they, and he was my intern. And okay. at the time I asked John Woo to do that, John Woo did refuse. So, <laughs> so <laughs> David was in, yeah, anyway. And it's funny, because I mean, nowadays when he goes to camera and then people say, it's um, you look very familiar. Did I see you somewhere? <laughs> oh yeah, okay, little guy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so it's like old days. I mean, people use his wife and a girlfriend as a video because when you work on a problem, why not? You know, you look at a video to show. Oh, today is Valentine's Day, right? Why not, right? So. Okay, so yeah, we we we, we did a in, uh, comparison with that. So so then we did a quite a bit of stuff on that. Uh, okay, I just I, I just switch. Some of the stuff. Okay, and then we. Uh, so that that's one uh, algorithm we develop uh, using deep learning. And then, um, w there are several uh, others. The other, the reason another reason why it's called CRAS. So basically, we use um, discriminate correlation filter. We combine correlation filter with residual learning um, similar to ResNet, and then use deep feature for that. And this is more efficient and more uh, robust. So that 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 is uh, how we do it. And we basically um, what it does is that we we want to correct we. Um, oh, hold on. This is too many click. Okay. <laughs> so what what is this? Okay. So if you use a reg um, regressor for to correlation filter to track this object, then you'll find that there is a heat map. So that's that tell you where the object is likely to be. But you know, it it is not so accurate. And you will see some th that is accurate when the object is clear. When you have a blurry image, it's not so accurate. So. I mean, obviously, it will become like this. So what we want to do is that we want to correct that. We want to compute the residue and then coerce the tracker to focus on the right region. So that that's what it is. So basically, you look at residue and then coerce the tracker. Tell the tracker, I mean, okay, don't just based on correlation because correlation doesn't tell you it doesn't it's not descriptive. It doesn't tell you what is correct, what is not. So you coerce and then you then then you will focus on the, the right region. So that's the main idea behind that, um, and all the codes are available, so you can download that and, and run that. Okay, so I'll, I'll just skip this one. Okay, ah, that's too many. Okay, okay. Um, also, so there are some some of the results that oh, yeah, that was. Wait, can I play this? I didn't try it. Okay. What? Ah, anyway, so and the other thing that the other thing is that when I visited John um, a while back, so I went to Seoul, and I look at a video, music video, and then there are a lot of girls that I cannot recognize because they look quite similar. So, so that was a very new problem. So we work on multi object tracking instead of pedestrian. We want to see okay, how do you recognize all the faces? And the thing is, they use different. Um, between scenes, they would they will have different addresses, so you would not be able to use a full body or or, con or context to do that. Uh, and and they will also have different shots and different head orientation. So what the idea is that okay, given a music video, how do you track the same person throughout the video, and how do you connect all of them together? And so and then you obviously you can use that the same algorithm for faces, players, cars, and pedestrians. And so, so that's uh, uh, so. Yeah, so these are typical, and you have a different shot change and then a uh, drastic lighting change. So this is a turn out to be a typical problem than it is, and especially some of the, some of them, for some of them they try to be cute, so they they will dress or uh, make uh, have similar makeup, so they will look similar, and it will it makes the problem very very difficult. Um, yeah, I'll just give the video. Okay, so, oh, so this, this so this is. Um, uh, let's see. Okay. Yeah, so these are videos. Some of them do re look very similar. It took me a while to re figure out who was who. <laughs> Actually, students also have hard time. I mean, they have to go through a video. If you just look at faces, then it's it's even closer. But if you look at hair, and of course they will help, you know. All right. 
right, let's see. Um, yes, and then only some of them would have different dresses between shots, so you cannot have the same. Um, again, you cannot use um, dress or hair to as as context to to figure out who is who. I think even it's hard for John Wu, but he doesn't care. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, we also test on Big Bang Theory and stuff like that, of course. All right, so um, and uh, in recent years, we also work on different tracking. So this is one, uh, one thing that we did for AR. So basically, it's, a, it's about 3D tracking. So basically, <laughs> I don't need a sound. Oh. Oh, wow, that's okay. Only a I, I thought I closed it. But basically, this is about um, AR. So basically, you can put a um, dark track. It's easier to track this way, but you want to track 3D. Of sparse pose estimation and dense alignment. You want to track the tip of the the pen so that you can figure out a 3D location and then within webcam and so that you can uh, you will know exactly where the location is. We can turn any flat surface into a digital writing surface with a quick calibration procedure by specifying four points on a plane using the pen tip. The dodeca pen digitizes the pen strokes of the ballpoint pen. Here, the user sketches an adorable bunny. Yeah, except the the the, the tips. Otherwise, everything you just need to use a webcam for tracking. There is, and no deep learning whatsoever is used. <laughs> A six DOF tracked stylus no, has several no. virtual reality applications. We don't have a, we don't have this, no. <coughs> the user can draw on a mid-air surface. You can surface. use that to double click and then you can, no. Or emit 3D ink by holding the space bar. The stylus can double as a cylindrical object such as a VR wand. or serve as a proxy for a general six-off object. What's the frame rate for tracking? I think it's real time, 15. I'm, although I'm not, it's, it, it's, I think it's in real time. And there is no step learning and no GPU used, just CPU. The dodecahedron can be attached to other physical objects, such as a keyboard for VR. Or simply be a 12 sided die that can be rolled for VR board games. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so let's see. Oh, yeah, okay. So, yeah, so, um, yeah, so now, um, as I mentioned, so um, we work on tracking, and now um, in, the, in the last few years, I, we have been also working on different kind of deburring. So, for generic faces, text images, and all, all different con uh, conditions, low light condition, and so on and so forth. And so, yeah, so one thing that we did was, back then, we, one work, problem we worked on was from faces. Suppose, I mean, these are blurry faces, and if you use, if you use the uh, state-of-the-art algorithm, Cho and Li algorithm for that, this is developed for generic images, and the result you get will be like this. So what we usually do is that we exploit structure of certain classes and, and, then, and use that as prior to figure out the ages, and then from that you will be able to estimate the blur kernel and so on and so forth. So, for example, for faces, you will be easily, well, you will be, at least you will be able to detect the contours and uh, um, some landmark. And from there, you will be able to extract edges. Then, 
you were able to get an example edge, and this edge will be very important because what happened below in, about the blur is that if you see dominant edges and see how they move, you will be able to figure out how camera move. And so the way, if, as long as you can extract dominant edge, then you will be, and this is global motion, okay? I, I, this is basically, I'm just talking about camera motion. And if, once you can extract edge, then you will be able to recover a camera tra trajectory, and from there you will be able to estimate kernels. And for, for, for face deburring, we just explore the facial structure for that. And so, and this, then you can use different uh, example. And then we, it turns out that uh, we, we did a several study on that. In the end, we find out it doesn't matter whether it's a adult or female or, um, all you need to do is just some face. It, for example, this one, this burning, I think this is Pietro Perona's kid. As I told you, you often use your kid as example. So then this will be the um, this will be the blurring input and this real image. And this will be the best match because we can extract contours. And then this will be the best matched uh, address. Even this is quite different. But we extract this this address and from there you will be able to recover a blur kernel. And this will be the result from Fer Rob Ferguson. This was a, this is Sigrab paper, this is a A sharp paper and so on and so forth. And so then you will be able to get much better result this way. And likewise, uh, the top is the same. So you, all you need is just a, a few examples, and you will be able to recover that. And likewise, you can use a similar trick for uh, text. Okay, so you can, you can do similar thing like this. And uh, the other thing we find out is that okay, in the night time, uh, this is very. I'm sure you have seen this. Okay, when you take a shot in the night, you will see this kind of uh, strict. And these are these are very strong prior to tell you how camera move. It's like when you hold a torch or whatever, and you, in the night you, you move that. That exactly tells you how the object moves, right? So once you can recover such light tricks, then you will be able to figure out the uh, camera trajectory. And the question is how do you detect all of them and then find out the best one? So that, that will be the, the problem of, of this paper. And so once you can, uh, I, I won't go into that, but basically there is a physical model for that, and you, can, you will be able to figure out where the, uh, the Light strict, and then find out the best one. Obviously, this would not be good one, right? And this would be good one. And this, some of them are double, so you don't want them. So there are some tricks to do that. And once you you will be able to uh, recover trajectory, then you will be able to uh, asset kernel and recover image that way. And the code is all, again most of the most codes of our papers are available online, so you can, you can find that and then run it. And so, so, that, so that's what we, we do with, I mean, as I mentioned, we, we, we work on deburring for faces, text images, and then for uh, light, uh, light scenes. And then we find out, and we, 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 we go from one stream to the other. So because you can work on deburring for specific objects, and then you can work on generic objects. So we, we also take a look back and then see whether we can find a way, find a prior for generic objects or not. So if you look at a natural image, they have, there are several methods that, that use, uh, they come up with prior for generic scenes or for low lights for text images, and then or for faces. So you can, for different scenarios, you can have different things, but you have to find different prior for different images. So what we find out is that, okay, we want to see whether that you can find one prior for all, all of them. Obviously, some of them are, are, can be useful for all images, but they, they do not work that well. So what we find out is that, again, this is without using um, deep learning. So basically, we use dark channel prior. It turns out this would be a very good prior to figure out the track, uh, the, um, the edges. And then you can, from edges, you will be able to recover um, camera trajectory and kernel and so on and so forth. And I, so these are some of the results. So basically, you have blurry image, and then this will be Krishna, and then this is Shri's, um, this, is, this was a state of the art at that time. And so then we, we would use different one, and then once you use dark channel prior, then you'll be able to extract address better. And the code is available. And it turns out that, the, okay, this one, you can apply for generic image and text image, and it works well. And this one was de developed specifically for address, and for text images, and this generic, this generic prior also works pretty well. Okay, and we also work on super resolution for generic objects. Again, we, we sort of play the same trick. We, we did that for specific objects and for generic objects. And for faces, again, we look into the structure and see whether we can extract some salient 
features and use that as prior for upsampling. So what happens in typical super resolution algorithms is that you you look at you have low resolution input and you took look at patches, small patches, and you look into the data set and you find the corresponding one, uh, the most similar one based on criteria. And then there is because low, for those low resolution patch, there is a corresponding high resolution one. And all you need to just take the high res, high, res, high res ones and then put them together. Okay, so that's the typical pipeline. And obviously, if you know this is a face, and when you search around trick area or I area, you would not, you do not need to search the entire data set because it doesn't make sense, <laughs> right? Why do you want to search a patch in I region with respect to one from trick or hair, right? So as long as you know the structure, then you can exploit that. And then so we we decompose face into three one, come to um, facial region and um, and background. So then basically you just decompose them into different ways and then you can um, upsample them better. Uh, so these are, and this was before Gong, okay? So <laughs> now there's a, there, is a, there are several methods based on Gong and the, the result pretty good, including one from NVIDIA, Progressive Gong. Um, so uh, these are some of the results we, we did. So basically, you, what, once you figure out uh, all the face region and you can do, you can use different, um, Again, this region you will be able to use the right right one for that, and eyes and so on and And this was I mean Simon Baker. You oh, this is Simon Baker. <laughs> so, you know. what? This is from the pi dataset. Yes, yes, yeah. And we also use a test on real dataset. Yes, but for pi because they have a they have a, a ground they align faces, so it's and it, the background is cleaner, so it's easier to extract contour in the data training set. Yes. Uh, I was curious. Uh, uh, in these cases, the ground truth is available, yeah. and the blur is simulated. Yeah. Is noise added? This one usually okay for. Yeah, that's a very good question. So, for the blurring and super resolution, usually there is little or none noise. Okay. Yeah. yeah we don't deal. Uh, yeah, you are right. If if you have a low resolution. Noisy blurring image. That's what you can get from CCTV, and that's that. In that case, yeah, it turns out we also uh, back after Boston bomb, Boston bombing, uh, there was footage from CCTV, right? And then was low res, blurry, yeah. and then probably some noise. I don't remember. Okay, so it will be very challenging. So all typical, all conventional events, we try every we try to deburr that or denoise that first, and uh, our sample data. Or upsample first and then do um, denoising whatever later. Nothing works well. Okay, what we find out in the end is gone. I mean, nowadays you can use gone for that. It's because for any synthesis, I mean, so you gone is based on noise vector, right? So it turns out that works better. But you know, for all those typical conventional methods, we try all kind of that. It doesn't work that well. Yeah. So. So yeah, you are right. In a way, in, in academia, the, uh, the problem setup is simpler. You got, you know, we deal with one thing at a time. Yeah. And for super resolution back then, okay, this is also before um, um, deep learning era. So again, so as I mentioned, so you have a you have an image. This is for generic objects. So when you have a small patch, you have to look through the entire data set. So it's a linear search. And imagine that, and the thing is that in order to encompass all possible patches, so you need to have large data set. So this kind of linear search is very time consuming, right? Because in one patch, you have, to, you have to match against 5 million or more. So obviously, the way to do it is to divide and conquer. You don't need to, uh, I mean, you can do clustering and then you do, I don't know why people didn't do that, but over time, it's the case. So, so basically, what we did was, you know, you take all the patches and you do k-means. Divide and conquer. So what you can, and later on, people also use KD tree for that. In a way, it's like uh, David Nister did for safety feature based fresh, uh, object recognition. I mean, you have all the features. You don't do linear search. You do tree search, tree based search, and that's more efficient, right? And so, the, so that's what we did, and it was, <laughs> it was much faster and it was cleaner. I mean, so, so that's that. I mean, it just came in. This is so simple. <laughs> And it's fast because you 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 don't need to do linear search. Uh, yeah. So these are some results. Okay. And so uh, and then so I often use a uh, uh, deep learning error as a division. So this is this is the recent work that we did after um, after uh, deep learning um, 
the burnout of deep learning. And so this one, again, we also use uh, the typical, the conventional method we use in vision and for that. For some reason, they, um, back then, at least, I mean, last year, not many people use pyramid for upsampling. What, for two factor, for uh, upsampling factor of two, then you do one, you build one model. For factor of four, you build one model. For factor of eight, you just do, you just do, you, uh, you just build a model directly for that. Obviously, you can do pyramid, whatever you learn for factor of two, you can reuse that for factor of four. And likewise, for factor of four, you can use the factor of eight. I don't know why people didn't do that, but we, you know. The, and the other thing we did was to use rest deep learning. I mean, this is similar to ResNet, but at that time, people didn't use that for, for SR. And that's that. Basically, you use pyramid and, um, and rest, uh, ResNet for that. I think Robert Perkins' group has a paper on the flashing gun, right? Like, uh, yes, so we compare, yeah, yeah, so, but that's for, yes, you're right, but that's for gun, yes, yes, you're right. We, we got that question at, uh, in review, and we rebut that, okay? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, obviously, you did a good job. Yeah, no, well, well, yeah I guess we, we did well, okay. <laughs> Okay, so then, uh, so this will be a, um, and then, I mean, now there's a VDSR, there's an even better one, uh, version for that. So they basically, now they, if you, for SR, they, they compare with DB and then, um, PSNR and execution time. And this VDSR, they have a new version that is way out here. The reason being that they use, they use very, all these measures are based on PSD as 500 uh, data sets. So that's imagery is not that high resolution. And, for re for recent one BDS, they have a I forgot the name, but they 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 use a similar method, almost the same, except that they are high resolution imagery, high definition images, and that that matters. That their result like here. <laughs> okay, um, oh, some results. Okay, anyway, so it's difficult to see here. Okay. And okay, so as I mentioned, so you're right, so for GAN, so as I mentioned, so this is low resolution <laughs> for image, or this is just low res image, okay? So, so we, we try, okay, uh, yeah, good. So we try different way, okay? You can, you can do, uh, de you can do deburr first and upsample later, or you can do upsample first and then deburr later. Nothing works well, okay? And so in the end, if we turn out that, okay, for this, use GAN, it works better. And this is low res, this I've, this is a 16 by 16 face image. This is really small. And we up to, well, this is four factor, 64 by 64. And now, and now you can use progressive gun and then you can get up to 1024 by 1024. Okay, so, and for, so all these, all these conventional methods will not work uh, and except gun. And then for this, we use a multi gun. Basically, we develop uh, for different classes, for faces and, and text images. Likewise for this, this is low rest image. And, all the, com all the state, we try all kind of state of the art method with different combination. N nothing works well, except gun. So does that mean we gave up the what No, 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 you, I mean, for now, we still use, the, like, for example, you know, we still use pyramids, stuff like that, right? I mean, <laughs> as it's all fine, I say, I mean, some, some, um, some students nowadays, they just want to use deep learning, that's it. I mean, it's just treat all vision problem as pattern recognition problem, you have a model and then you collect data, input, output, and then that's it. No, no, I mean, that's not, that, that gets you somewhere and the best one is probably pretty good, but that's certainly not that that is, you know, you still need to reuse the, the you know. So what I was thinking if you go back to your results, the yeah. last image, uh, the, the results generated from MC again, I think. Uh, this one? Yeah. In fact, if you look into, for example, either S C or M C again, it's still quite blurry, right? Yes. If so you then apply some of the because it's it's, it's blurry but it's smooth. If you apply some of the conventional yes. methods, can you sort of improve it? So as you can tell for, from the paper, for often often time, what you see is the best effort, best result you can get when you apply to different image. Your miles may I mean you <laughs> may vary. Okay. So even for, you are right, so we, also, we are also testing pro progressive gun, and we find out it works well, but it works well in some other images, not all other images. Sure. And one student, one intern that is working with me now is using structural information for that. So obviously you have to add in some more structure for that, because what gun does is it takes all the noisy vector, each bit it will, it will be render noise. You try to synthesize as much as you can. There is no structural in mind, 
So there is no notion of structure. So basically, we want to we want to uh, use for to for specific object. Okay, we play the same thing. For specific specific object, you can extract you can extract structure and use that as regularizer. And for generic image, we want to use semantic segmentation as a structure so that you can um, you can better synthesize the result. Otherwise, without that, even there's a Pix2 uh, HID, uh, Pix2 HD uh, developed at uh, NVIDIA by Mingyu, and that one works well, but that requires specific semantic mask. You need to have that. You need to have ground truth. For that, uh, that is NIP's paper. So basically, that one uh, for generic object, uh, generic image, it works well, but you need to have a ground truth semantic mask. When we replace that with one that you can get from algorithm, say, for PSP net or whatever, and you apply the semantic uh, mask and with this gun model that he developed, it doesn't work that well. So there is always room for improvement. And uh, as usual, I mean, of course, we still need to resolve back to whatever we have learned before. OK, so then some image, we also work on image and video segmentation. So uh, we, ha I mean, we often use example because we like learning. So we, we often, for specific object, we often learn from examples and use that for uh, different for different tasks, for deburring, for super resolution, and for uh, segmentation. So, for example, this this is one. Um, uh, so this is also very straightforward. So, once uh, between two frames, what you want to do? You want to segment objects. If you can, if you have a correct optical flow, it's very easy to segment the object. If I tell you the option, object seg uh, ob segmentation mask, then you will be. It's very easy to estimate optical flow. Okay, so now if you have object in mind, and then basically the thing, if you, in the first frame, if I tell you this is the object, it's just bounding box, you, I, don't, I don't need a, a precise mask. Then basically you, you will be, if you, you can uh, formulate the problem as an as a optimization problem, more like, it's an iterative optimization, but you can also put in the uh, uh, probability framework, then it will be EML with it. And once you know that, you can do the other, you can iterate it to up, uh, update the result. And so for this one, you, uh, sorry, if you know the first frame, then you will be able to do this. And then for video, then you, the result will be like this. All you need to just enclose the, the object of interest in the first frame, and the rest will go like this. You will be able to segment our objects. But you need the first frame. And this is in a way that like online tracking we have been doing. So we, we've been doing a track and a sec too. Um, so, and the other thing is that if you have a lot of image without, without mask, without the first frame mask, then you still can do cross segmentation. And this is more involved, okay? So basically, all the video, you can break into all the segments, and you can build a graph, and then figure out what is what. Um, so, I'll skip that. Uh, so, so, this is the same thing as Pascal 20, okay? But the thing here is that in the first frame, you don't, you don't give the first frame. You don't tell what object it is in the first frame. And it will be a graph and figure out all the, all the detail for you. In this case, uh, for your first frame, do you have No, to this one we don't. We don't. Oh, okay. Just yeah. the code segmentation. Yeah, yeah, just code segmentation. And you can do co parsing. This is similar to segmentation, but I'll, I'll skip this one. And, um, and then if you can do segmentation, you can do, uh, certainly you can do same parsing. I mean, one of the problems with same parsing is that oftentimes um, you, <coughs> most algorithms work well except small objects and rare, rare classes. Because the thing is, uh, if you look at arrows and this, or uh, if you use back power or whatever, that or, or gradient descent, this object will not matter because the number of pixels is small, and so it, it, <laughs> the arrow will be ignored. Okay, so often time you get pretty good result, but not for the rare classes. But these classes tend to be more important. For example, when you back up the car, when you have cars and will back up, it's easy to detect pedestrians, adults, but it's, it will be more difficult to de detect kids. Uh, but then <laughs> the uncooperative objects are more important. So uh, so what we do is that we, we use a rare, ex there's one way we uh, we we just expand. The, the problem with this is to start with, you have you have few pixels to train with. So you have to use some way to expand the data set. So we use rare class expansion. So you expand more, you collect more data on the fly so that you can uh, build a class file for that. And so, the, and then uh, we also use context for that. Um, I'll ask give the detail for this one. So basically, what, what, what it means is this, okay? If you look at an image like this and you need to build a class file so that you can do parsing, 
If you look at distribution, then you will see that some are some of them are rare. And then from this, you will be able to figure out some of the classes are more important. So you have to expand, you have to include, you have to go back to the data set to increase the number of examples in this data set on the fly for particular classes so that you can build a classifier for this one, two, two parts. And that's the main idea. And, and so these are some of the results we, we did a while back. So and this is uh, GMAT's work. And this is Thai, and this was, this was a stereo art result then. And likewise, um, for human annotation, <laughs> even if you look at human annotation, we find that, okay, sometimes humans are lazy because if you mechanical theory, if you do not do, if you do not do quality control, then people, um, human may not, uh, may not annotate that well. But for our, so for some reason, we can, and we can figure out all the, uh, all the, all the segments. And so uh, the other work we did was basically, if you can do uh, same parsing, then you can do, you can, um, you can swap the sky. So basically, for this specific problem, we want to figure out where the sky region is, mainly the background, and then you can find a specific, uh, different sky background and then swap that. And this, although this seems to be a simple problem, it turns out to be a, a challenging problem because you have to take the, the you have to take land, uh, landscape into account and you want to brand color correctly. So uh, the way to do that, so there are some three parts in there. There's same, same, uh, sky segment and search and replacement. And the main thing is, again, we use uh, semantic information for that. So the, this is one particular part. So for segments, basically for the long thin objects, this will be very difficult. If you use a stereo RCI segmentation algorithm, you will, get, you, you will not get perfect result. And you have to do, uh, in the in the world that I just presented, you either need to use rare class expansion or you would have to do some trick so that you can get a better result. This will be the result if you just use off the shelf as a segmentation uh, algorithm. And, and for this, we use a trick similar to rare class expansion so that you can get a be better segmentation. And, and as I mean, so there are also small objects like a rare class, right? So then this, you want to be, you want to segment all these things out. And the other thing is that the uh, contrast is not high. So then it, it's not so easy to segment, but without our algorithm, you'll be able to do this. And so here's one question for you. <laughs> so which one is the real image? One of them is real. One of them is our result. A, B, C, D. Which one is the real? Yeah, A, B, C, D. Which one is which one is real image without alt? I mean, this is also a problem. I mean, which one? I mean, it, you know, how do you know whether an image has been tempered or not? That's a different problem. Forensic, okay. A, B, C, D. Okay, which one? A. You say A. Okay. Real. Are you asking real? C is true. Yes. Katsu is correct. <laughs> Katsu, good yeah, eye. <laughs> Experience tells, okay, this is real. All the others are tempered, or all the others are swap the result. But at least you can tell the, the result pretty, uh, pretty I mean, reasonable, right? So these are some of the results. So this is input image, and this is swap the result. So no, I didn't cover the, the coloring, uh, color tone, okay? But basically, you have to you have to change the background, and you have to change the tone, because um, the background color will, be, will, will not be the same, right? And likewise, this and this. So you have to change both background and that. Uh, yeah. This is some sort of, uh, yeah, anyway, so I, I just give it, okay. So, uh, so then, um, so as I mentioned, so we also do, um, this will get to the thing that uh, we work on um, star transfer. So this is one uh, problem we, we, we work on in the last few years. So basically, this will be, so if you look at all the recent uh, star transfer, basically, uh, like Prisma, then, Except one, basically, there are only about 16 or 32, 32 models. And for each one, for each star, you have to build one model, okay? So what we want to see is that whether, and then you have only one result. So what we want to see is that whether you can build a model so that you can synthesize, you can, you can have 1,000 styles. And then, uh, and you can generate, for each input, you can generate several results, okay? And the, re the code is available, okay? So, so the rest, so we start with, uh, I mean, the. This is very simple. Uh, the first one is very, okay. The, this part is very similar to the state of uh, algorithm, the, except that here we add in some selection <coughs> unit. And we want to uh, add in one thousand style for that. And, and I'll, I'll tell you more uh, result in a bit, okay. So, but for, so 
so basically we treat starch transfer as a texture synthesis problem. So this will be the original texture, and you want to and you want to figure out the texture uh, contents, and then you found found that you will be able to synthesize a result. And this is we, at the one time we call it a um, single frame or single image dynamic texture. So basically, if you found this image, if you can figure out the texture, then you will be able to do that. About uh, about around 2000, there were quite some work on dynamic texture. But there's a you have a short video and how do you build a LDS a linear dynamic model and you can synthesize the result. And but this is based on one single image. Once you can figure out the texture, and then you will be able to synthesize the result that way. And the other thing, as I mentioned, so basically, um, if you look at the Prisma and all these, uh, all the others, so basically, um, they 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 only generalize, they only synthesize one result. So, but if in this world, we want to synthesize, we want to perturb the output a little bit so that you can synthesize different result, slightly different. And because and and the other thing of the other interesting thing is that because we for any two image we can analyze a texture model, and you have a, a you have selection unit and then you can do morphing between these two, and this is just for fun. Okay. Basically, you analyze the result here here and you will you'll be able to because for any frame you will be able to synthesize the result. Um, you can see it's like I mean. It's a bit similar to PCA, but not the same, okay? But you have a low dimensional manifold point, and you can project to high dimensional result. So are you interpolating? Yes, the yes, the yes. Two yes, <coughs> two vector, yes. Two vector in low, in low dimensional. And, it, and any time we, we do that, basically it's like you have a low dimensional manifold, you have two points, you interpret between the two. At any point, you can, you can sense that one result. Sure. And likewise, for, okay, so this will be a summary result. So, yeah, so you, in content and based on the style, based on content and style, you can graduate uh, things like that. And there is, uh, there is also close to fine, I didn't mention that, okay, but the code is available, you can, you can play with that. And the other thing is that we add 1,000 style in one model, not just one, model, <laughs> one style per model. Are you able to expand it to the 1,000 yes. style? Yes. Oh. Ah, OK, that's another question. I was going to get it. Yes, ah, that's a good question. OK. So yes, good. Your model can handle 1,000. What about 1,001? OK. So, so that, OK, I'll get to it in, in a minute. OK, that's good. That's exactly what we did next. OK. So these are one input, and then uh, different style, you get different result. OK, so OK. Okay. All right. So yes. What about one thousand one style? Okay. So this is what it is. So we we developed one. Uh, this, uh, we just presented two months ago at NIMS. So basically, it, as Gang mentioned, so basically for those one thousand style, you have seen that before. And then what if I give you one uh, one different style that you have never seen before? What do we do? Well, this is what we do. What we did in this paper. So this is you know, we call universal style transfer. So basically, what it is, it, it turns out to be very simple. It has cross form solution. What we do is that okay, this is content and then start this con for content you, you use one auto encoder and for style we also use one auto encoder. And once you encode both style and content, you can put them together. There's one way to put them together. And when you render, you just need to combine use the con it's not quite concatenated. It use the con uh, the vector combination of style and content and then you can render the result. And that's that. And this algorithm has a cross form solution and it only involves eigenvector. This is not based on well we use deep features but this is not based on deep learning. Okay. It, it, we, um, it, we do not have a uh, basically we just use a VGG feature. Okay. So so what, so this has um, I won't go into detail but this is just what it is. Right? Basically you have a content and you you, s you compute a covariance vector, vector based on that, and you get an encoder. You get an encoded vector. You take this in, and then take the, this is whitening. What, as you, um, so, so the idea is very straightforward. Suppose that, I mean, you want to get a structure. You want to get the, the main structure of this guy, so basically it's whitening. You take out all the, remove all the noise, and then, and you just get the essential. And likewise, for your, uh, con uh, for your style, you also take out all the, all the other, just get the in essential uh, information. And that's called whitening. And coloring is the a, is a is opposite tr uh, process. Okay, we have whitening, and the, the opposite process is called coloring. Okay, and then, so basically, you encode. Encode the uh, content vector, and then you, con 
and then you combine that um, content and um, style together, and then then you use the um, style. You you use the eigenvector from the style image and to do coloring, and that's that. It has a cross form solution, and it runs pretty fast. It's not real time yet, but it's pretty fast. And and that's why uh, in, we also submit one paper with real time stuff. Okay, I, I mentioned a bit. But this one, uh, so these are the results. There is no training. Basically, just input this content, this style, and then you will get this content, content and style, and then you get this. Likewise, content and style, you get this content and style, this. And there is another work on uh, by search Bologna student uh, working on similar problem. And that was previous ICC view, and this we our result were published in uh, NIPS uh, two months later. Um, so you just crop different ways, and you can uh, generate result. And the the code is a variable, and there there, there are several implementation of that. And uh, I didn't I didn't mention cost one. As I mentioned, we use a VGG feature, and then you can use VGG feature at different layer, and it will get different result. Uh, I am not go into detail on this. Okay, but okay. So another question is that. Okay. Uh, okay. You can do style transfer. Good, but the, you destroy the contents. Okay. If you look at this, this input and the, this will stylize result. Fine. Okay. But what if I, I don't want to destroy the content? So, so the, so this is the work we submitted to CVPR. So basically, on, to generate uh, to do stylization, but without destroying the contents. So this is photo reason. So basically, um, all right. So. So basically, uh, there are two steps. Okay, first thing is that we use the same one that we we use. This is WCT. This is the one uh, we present. Uh, I just mentioned uh, we publish in NIPS. And there is a after after we get this, there is another process we did based on silence detection and also cross form solution. And with correction, you can get this. So basically, this step is still based on NIPS paper, uh, universal style transfer. And this one will be you just correct that. Okay, and and then uh, you will. The, you would not destroy the content. There is a post-processing step for that. And how, how do you compare this directly to color transfer? Because you yes, you okay. So do you have any texture, uh, sketch texture. So we, what we find out is that oftentimes it's global. Yes, this is more or less like colorization. Okay, yes, and but there are still some differences. We also compare with some colorization algorithm, and it doesn't work that well. So yeah, you are right. Okay, so more or less this is global method. And now we all, and for this, there is one thing I didn't mention. Okay, so open time, I, I can show you. So the other thing is that you can also get a mask for that. Um, this is here. Oh, yeah, yeah. I show you result for uh, this. Uh, this. Uh. Oh yeah, so you can do mask for that. Okay, this, um, often time you just take a whole image for transfer, but uh, for some of that you can use you can use you can um, you for global stuff. Then basically is more like correlation. Okay, but for the other you can create some seg segment mask and tell where you want to transfer. Okay, and so this is the thing that I want to mention. Uh, the, the NIPS work we call it WCT because it, you based on whitening, coloring, transform. And so this will be the content, and then you know if you use WCT, this will be the result you, you get. Okay, and this will be um, it's stylization. So you but you destroy the the content. Um, so what we find is that you instead of use up sampling, you use um, up pooling, and then um, the other thing. So this. This is what we call photo WCT. You can get a much uh, slightly better result. At least you see more codex sign. You see better. This is input. This is WCT based on NIMS work. And this is after we use unpooling layer, and you get a slightly better result. And from this, there's one more step we did. So basically, we use saliency. That also the work we did in 2003. Oh, sorry, 2013. And then it, it also has a cross bone solution, and it's also based on eigenvector. It's very straightforward. And this is WCD, and then after you apply that, you get this. So you, so, so you will get you don't destroy the, the content. And so there are some results. Okay, some compare. Uh, I'll show you this. Can I see this is stylized result? Do I have coloring result here? Um, 
Okay, this loon, this is a surge student. Oh, no, no, sorry, not little. This one is not surge student. Okay, let me see. <coughs> okay, so here's fun, fun part. So basically, you have content, you have style, and you want to, basically, you, you can, here, I, you have to specify the mask because you want to, ma you want to take out this part and then pro plug in this, and then you can get this. And you can swap that, say this is your content and this is your style. And you can, you can take out a, a break over. And likewise, this content, this style, you want to get the grass uh, uh, material, you can get this. You can swap that. This content is, is a perfume a bottle, and then you want to get this kind of texture. And likewise, this, you can swap that. Okay, uh, I don't have correlation result here, sorry. But but uh, but this one is almost in real time. But uh, but um, just now we get the we get the real time um, we get the real time result we, with one GPU because the uh, VGG feature is is long. So when you compute eigenvalues, it still takes some time. With one GPU Titan X, it runs about uh, forty milliseconds per frame on um, five twelve by five twelve imagery. Okay, so this is the other thing we did for learning filter. So I'm almost done here. So, so basically, this is uh, so what we want to do is that we want to learn some filter, bilateral filter, shock filter, and so on and so forth in in, in one model. And so, and so basically, this is this is a um, rolling guided filter. So you want to remove all the tiny uh, details and just remain the texture, uh, main structures. And likewise, you want to do shock uh, shock um, shock filter, and then you want to do denoising. And uh, you want to um, in painting and or colorization or color inter sorry color interpolation. So basically, here what is you have grayscale image and you have some color information. So how do you propagate information to f to to paint the entire image? So so what so we, um. There's one work by uh, Shidi, uh, so they use a CNN model to learn all these filters, but the problem is that they use uh, FIR filter, and the model size is large, and it's, it runs slowly. So what we find out here is that you can use a recursive filter for that, and this is a hybrid model with CNN and uh, RNN, and the result is that it's much faster, and the model size is smaller, and the result is better. Uh, I don't, um, so, and then what it is, you can get a, um, you can get a, um, Address like this. Let me show you some results here before I end this one. So, so this is what uh, this one. Uh, I, I'll skip you all detail. The, the code is available. You can run it. Okay, so. Yeah, the main idea is to use FIR filter, and but if you use FIR IR filter, oh, sorry, if you use IR filter, then basically you have to work, uh, you have to pay attention to the model stability, and there's one way to do that. I'll, I'll show you the result instead. <coughs> and so in the end, what you need to do, basically what we do is that you you take an image. As a consider image as one D signal, and you, what you need to do is to figure out use RNN and figure out whether two pixels are closely related or not. If two pixels are closely related, the affinity is high. So when you have some information, you have to propagate that. On the other hand, if you have two pixels on the boundary, then they are not related. So when you have a one some information on one pixel, you don't need to propagate that. So in the end, you will see because we treat images one D signal. So you will look at x axis and y axis. You will have some. You will this will be the um, parameter map that will tell you coefficient map to tell you whether um, any two pixels are closely related or not. Because it, it tells you the structure basically, and that when you have some information, you can propagate that for filter and so on and so forth. So these are some of the results. Uh, this, uh, qualitative is also performed better and it's it's faster. So. So this is the noise, okay, the noise result, and then this current um, result. You have fifty percent random pixel, and you can do in painting for that. Again, basically, what it does really is, given this image, you figure out the affinity between two pixel, and that basically tell you the structure information of the image. And when you have some partial information, you use that to 
to uh, this, to propagate the, the necessary information and for coloring or for imprinting or uh, or for filtering. So this is one, di and uh, also th you can also use, use this. Basically, this is image, uh, input image, and then this is the color you want to take. Okay, so you there are some random pixels that you have. Okay, so you can think this as a semi-supervised learning problem. You have an image, and you you are given some random spots with some information. Where each pixel, you could take color from the other image. So for this image, you can build a graph, and you can know the affinity between two pixels. And once you have some color information, you can propagate all the information to the other nodes, and you can get this. I'll just skip this again. Okay. Oh uh, yeah, so uh, so and then and so this one is basically two D. So, <laughs> uh, sorry, this is one D. We, we treat image as one D, and I'll just show you this quickly. So, for one D signal, so the other thing is that um, you can this one. We, this is one D special propagation network, and we can extend it to two two to two D, and then um, that uh, we presented in NIP, uh, NIPS, and that is also using this problem. I'll just show you some results. So basically, this is like rendering. So you want to segment the foreground and background, and you want to blur the background. So and this we can do that with um, uh, with any object. Not, uh, for iPhone or Google phone, you can do that for portrait mode for upper body. But this one you can operate on full body, and that you don't need any depth sensor, and you can do that. So what it does is that okay. So we use that. Uh, remember uh, the thing that I mentioned uh, in ECCB is based on 1D, and then we send it to 2D. I didn't present here. That that is based on NIPS work, and basically you can use it. What it does is again, give an image, you figure out, you build a graph, you figure out a, a pixel affinity, and then you have some core segmentation result like this. Basically, what it, you you can use some algorithm to that core segmentation result. Usually, it's not it's good, but it's not good enough, and you can refine that with uh, with um, the 2D version of the, of the SPN, a Spatial Propagation Network for that, and you can refine the result and put them together. Likewise for depths, you can figure out the relative depth information between any two pixels, and then basically you can refine the result and put them together, and that's that. So as I mentioned, so basically you have segmentation, and then you can propagate the information in 2D instead of 1D, and then you can, you can better segment the imagery and, prob and, then, and then use that for a, port a portrait rendering. Uh, okay, uh, summary is all. Let me see, okay. I'll just show you some result first. Oh, yeah. So these are summary results. So basically, it works on uh, f full body, not just half body. This is by due data set, I believe. And basically, it, you can process it offline. And this is mask, and this is um, the depth map, and this is rendering result. Notice that basically you can seg once you can segment a foreground out, you can blur the background, and you can um, put them together. And this does not require a, any depth sensor. But the background is uniform. Um, not quite, because you can see that there's also, you know, there are also some clouded background. It's not quite. I mean. Some of them are pretty noisy. Okay. If it's if it's like a webcam, then it's easier. But this is diverse. It's nice. And we will give the call uh, once the review is over. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think I'm almost done here. Let's see. Oh yeah, this is actually, okay. Yeah, so so that that's that. Yeah, so um, if you're interested, you can go to my website and uh, find the source code. Most of the stuff are available. I mean, except some of them are with Adobe. And uh, if so, we cannot read this code. And but otherwise, for others, we we, we usually give out the code and you can run that. Thank you. Any questions? Want to raise here? We still got uh, perhaps 20 minutes here. Actually, uh, uh, you extracted the boundary and then you know to put the different color. Right? And what is the difference between there was a traditional method called lightness theory, back uh, back to the light lightness, and then you know uh, 
basically that method separate uh, body color and the illumination. And then, you know, uh, of course, that, is, that process is a kind of a, a derivative. And in order to recover uh, uh, integral coefficient, uh, integral constant is necessary. So in one sense, you are doing lightness theory. However, when you recover the original color, you are putting appropriate uh, uh, integral uh, constant based on the uh, proposed color, right? You are talking about the rendering, uh, post rendering. Right, 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 right. So that for that one, the the most difficult part is that people appear with, with different orientation and they are with different background. And so it's it was not. So no, 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 I think the second from the last actually. Uh, let's see. This one. Uh, let's see. No, 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 not this one. So maybe let's talk of offline. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe. Oh, okay, that's okay. Yeah, uh, well, uh, you can grill me any question, you know. So, but for uh, if that's for that one or for um... oh, that one, that one, that okay. one, that one. So for this one, yeah. So basically, this is about star transfer. So yeah. So this one, you just. Again, so here we don't do any, we do not really do any segmentation. No, no, no. maybe, maybe not this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe this one, this one, this one. Okay. So basically, you are doing some segmentation based. There is a maybe that's a top of line. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's okay. Well, I'm sure you know more. Right? You know a lot, you know. Uh, so. So for some of, some of that we use segmentation. Some, this one we do use segmentation, but for some of them we do not. We just treat the whole image as is. No, there is a you know a one, one D uh, derivative, uh, you know a one D derivative from the horizontal direction and the vertical direction. Uh huh. Uh, the one with the coffee Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's that, filter. That, yeah, okay. That yes. That's this. Okay. You know there is a you know the lightness right lightness theory. Actually, I don't. Oh, you know, human has a you know color constancy, and even though illumination color is different, uh -huh. somehow we can perceive the original yeah. color. That is called a, a color constancy issue. Yes, that's definitely. And you know, you know, some of the theory uh, to uh, explain that effect is called lightness. Yes. And basically, uh, lightness theory says, you know, uh, first you have to make the derivative of the scene, uh -huh. and then. Uh, to remove uh, some constant value, yes. constant, uh, constant uh, uh, gradient uh, illumination. Yeah. And then, once you uh, separate from illumination and uh, uh, reflectance, then based on that value, you integrate. And in order to integrate the original uh, integration, you need an uh, integral constant. And for integral constant, we are use, using the same value. But in your case, probably, you are using different constant value coming from the uh, your choice actually. Yes. So yeah. So in this work, what we really want to do is just figure out. You know, you are right. So we basically here we want to figure out the underlying structure and it, the pixel relationship between any two of them. Right, right, right. And then, so for that, you, then after that, you can uh, build a graph, and then you can propagate information between right, right, two right, pixels. Exactly. So, uh, I don't know the paper that you are referring to. I, I'll look it up. But basically, on, 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 the, on the robot vision, the chapter three or something. Oh really? Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, obviously, this one is related to edges. There's no question about that. Except that here, we just need to figure out the address and then build a graph so that we know the affinity between them too. And for filtering or for a different um, processing, then you use that to propagate information. It's like a, you have a graph. Suppose you have a, you have all the pixels, and then I tell you some value for some yeah, pixels, yeah, yeah. and then you can use that in ways. Loosely speaking, is like a belief propagation. You have some information here, there, and then how do you send out a signal to all the others so right. that everybody agrees on the result? Yeah, I have a sense that the one one dimensional. Uh, uh, the derivative in two process may have been somehow captured yeah. by the uh, graph. Right, right, right. Yeah, obviously, if you took the derivative, right. you get the address, you get all the information. Yeah. Except, um, I, I'll look it up, but I, 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 it just said here, we, all, we need to build that and use that to 
to send our uh, signal to the others. Yeah, actually, you know, from that uh, paper, I got the uh, idea of smoothness constraint, and then I propose actually. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Yeah, you were thinking about the whole shanks. Uh, that's originally, I proposed that one. Optical <laughs> flow? Oh. oh. Yeah, opt no, I apply that one to the shape from shading, and then yeah. Paul apply that one to optical flow. Actually. Oh, okay. So, historically, my paper is older than his paper. <laughs> three months, three months difference. Wow. From now on, I should say Katsu's paper instead of Hobbes. Oh, we do. So, right. Okay. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. I think. Uh, any more questions? Well, I guess if you are talking with the candidate one on one, then you could uh, bring some of the discussions over. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Right. Thank you. Thank you.